Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series, and I am very, very excited today to talk to Judge Rex Marvell. Um, he was referred to us by one of our board members, Ms. Tara Long, because we wanted to talk to a judge that we can get very candid with and just ask as many questions as we can. Plus, we know that there are elections and so forth going on right now in Charlotte or Mecklenburg County. So we are talking to the judge for the people. He is actually a judge in family court. And so we want to just really talk to him about him being a judge, what he does, how he became a judge, and how did he in, end up in family court? And many more questions. So I want to please invite you to come and sit down so that we can talk to a judge together. If you have any questions, as always, please put your questions in the comments. I will be watching and I will make sure that we get your questions answered. Hello, judge, how are you doing? Hi, Tiffany. Great, thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here. Good, good. We are very happy to have you too. We've had a lot of um, authors, um, we've had advocates, we've had a celebrity or two. We've never had a judge, so this is a first. <laughs> we're, we're a mystery, I know. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely an honor. I'm glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to, um, to talk to us tonight. So we're gonna just jump right in there. Um, tell us about you. What, I guess, your career that led up to you being a judge? Yeah, um, before I was a judge, uh, I worked at the Mecklenburg County Public Defender's Office uh, where I worked for people that couldn't afford counsel. At the same time I was doing that, I was also a professor of legal writing at Central Piedmont and okay. uh, did a lot of volunteer and sat on the, the board of directors for the Mecklenburg County um, bar, which is like the administrative agency for lawyers in Mecklenburg County. Um, uh, the reason I am a judge or really kind of sought out the position is because as, uh, when I was a child, my life was impacted by judges. So my, uh, my, my mother suffered from a really debilitating addiction uh, and that kind of brought our family to court for criminal stuff, for family stuff, and ultimately uh, she had her, her custody terminated. Uh, for, for me and my siblings. So I know what it's like to have a judge determine where you're going to live. And I know that um, judges' decisions don't just impact the lives of the person in court that day. It's, it's everyone. Uh, so that's why I, I always took the role so seriously. And I you know, really, really wanted to be there so I could make a positive difference. Wow. Yeah. Um, when I was, uh, I believe, 16 going into 17, I um, was in the foster in foster care myself. Um, so I do remember sitting in the courtroom in front of a judge, not knowing who this big judge was that was standing in front of me. Um, and, you know, having my social worker and my advocate sitting beside me, but it was very intimidating. Um, so I, I've been in the foster care system and yes, it's definitely a very scary moment to be in court and have someone that's never met you before make really big decisions for your life. Yeah, sure. Definitely, definitely. Um, with your reason for wanting to become a family um, court judge, how did your mm -hmm. siblings feel about that? Oh, well, I Everyone's been supportive so far. Uh, I have my the sibling I'm the closest with, so I have I have two half um, siblings, and then I also have step siblings too. But my my closest sibling, my sister, we have the same mother and father. She lives less than a mile away from me, and okay. uh, she's she's probably next to my wife, if not higher than that. My biggest uh, champion and ally and friend. So uh, I, I see her all the time, so. That's great, that's great. Um, how long have you been a family court judge? I've been a, approaching a year. So by the time we're at the election, I, I will be at a year and a month. So not as long. I am Mecklenburg County's newest judge and also our youngest judge. Wow, that's that's a big accomplishment, <laughs> very big accomplishment. Um, tell us what is your kind of your your daily routine? What is it? How does your day start out, and what what does a normal day look like for you as being a judge during COVID? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Let's let's talk maybe pre-COVID, and then we'll talk about COVID. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, pre-COVID, the routine is is kind of what you'd expect. You know, court is open at, at nine o'clock, and they and they stop at 
at five, but they're really kind of down at 4.30. So what I used to do is drop kids off at school, uh, go into uh, court and I, I like read, you know, I've got paper at, um, mail every single day of like orders and things that I need to go through, go start the session at nine. And then, you know, I'm there hearing, hearing folks um, cases from domestic violence issues to child custody, child support, alimony, equitable distribution. And these are people with lawyers and people without lawyers. So I hear a lot of different things over the course of a day. Um, but that was pre-COVID. That was kind of like, you know, you'd expect nine to five, you're in the courthouse working. Uh, now it's with, with the, the first shutdown, uh, we were still operating uh, because the chief justice, so like the, the highest ranking judge in North Carolina, uh, she had us uh, still work with uh, emergency functions and content okay. essential matters. So for me as a family court judge, that means I was still hearing domestic violence cases. Right. And, and, and as you, you probably heard, and we've, we've heard in the, the media a lot and on social media, like DV did not go away during COVID. In fact, it shot up. And right. I mean, it's not a surprise, like people can't leave their homes. You know, victims can't leave a home. Um, and in a lot of cases, the stresses are already higher because there's a pandemic going on and everyone's stressed out. And I mean, it just kind of exasperated, you know, just increased the situation that was already potentially volatile. And so it was really important that that occurred. So we kept hearing things. And, uh, and for a while, even when we were in the biggest shutdown, we still had two courtrooms operated all the time uh, to hear DV cases. And then our magistrates, of course, are hearing them 24 hours a day. And I still get those calls. The magistrates before they issue a protective order have to call a judge. And so I always have to keep, have my phone with me and, and ready for a magistrate to call. Right, right. Yeah, um, well, so I'm not, I know that we talked um, privately about what I do and that I'm an advocate um, against domestic violence and also sexual assault as well, which was one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because yes, it is definitely in the news and we're definitely seeing the domestic violence statistics have, are, have increased at a very, very alarming rate since COVID-19 started. So how, what have you seen? Well, it's probably not the best question because you just answered it. So when it comes to domestic violence, pre-COVID, was that the majority of your cases um, before being a family court judge? Or can you tell us what is the kind of the percentage of what your cases were before COVID versus now? Um, before um, and, and even during, if, if it's a, if it's a case that I'm already hearing the child custody component, I'm going to get the domestic violence case, which okay. you can imagine happens a lot. You know, there's already an issue with custody. There's already a, a dispute and, and, a, and a relationship that's gone awry. So like, you know, the likelihood of DV is, is there. Um, when it's a new case and there are, are kids involved, it's going to go in front of the, the first judge. And uh, that's, you know, the first, essentially the first appearance for the domestic violence case judge. And then it can be brought back to a family court judge uh, if it's going to have ongoing uh, custody and, and kids. Uh, the other thing that we used to do before COVID is we'd have rotations. So once a month, like I'm in my family courtroom um, for four, four weeks a month, but that last week a month, um, I would end up in a domestic violence courtroom. So either the criminal DB or the, um, or the uh, civil DB, which is the protective orders. Wow. So yeah, I don't know a percentage, but it's a lot of domestic violence. Cases. A lot of domestic violence, which 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 we can assume. Okay, so when it comes to domestic violence cases, I really wanted to talk to you about that. Um, with working with with victims, mm -hmm. and then them having to navigate the the court system. As a judge, what do you feel is some of the important things that a victim should know? when it comes to actually having to go to court regarding their domestic violence cases? Well, the big, and I know court is a scary place for one, and especially if you're there to face uh, an abuser, like it's a scary, you know, there's a whole element of fear on that too. But if you don't come to court, we can't do anything. And that's, that's the biggest thing for a judge. Like I'll, I'll read across, you know, the emergency order that happens, like I said, in front of a magistrate where they have to call the judge on the phone to see if they can issue it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'll, I'll have that in front of me and I'm in the courtroom and there's no victim present. And I'll, I'll read, you know, the allegations and sometimes they're very, very serious. 
uh, and I can't do anything. You know, if someone doesn't show up to court, like we can't enforce a protective order. And that goes the same for the criminal case. You know, again, there, there are other reasons why you might not want to come to court. But if, if, you're, if you're coming because of fear, I mean, there are deputies present, there are victims advocates present, there are nonprofits that will, will sit with you in the courtroom. Um, so, you know, we can't, the system doesn't work if you, or can't work to help you if you don't come. Right, that's very important. And I'm pretty, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't let you finish. Go ahead, I'm sorry. All I said is like, that's the biggest, biggest thing that I think I've seen that's, yeah. Yes, so you have to show up. If you're, if, and I, I know that that's something that we do, we will go to court with um, victims and we will, um, you know, talk to them about the process of, you know, filing the charges, what happens next, so forth and so on. Um, so getting to court, you see, is that for you is one of the biggest issues that you have in court, which is understandable. So we have victims who they're scared to death of their, their abusers. It takes a lot for a victim to leave their abuser in the first place and then have to face them in court is a total another beast <laughs> that yeah. has to take place because what I've heard and me being a survivor myself is that you get into court and now you have your abuser telling all of these lies about you and making all of these accusations about you um, when and now you're being seen as a victim all over again. Um, I know that's a, a big fear when it comes to victims. So how do you handle that in your courtroom when there's so much back and forth and you know the, the abuser saying this and the victim saying that how do you handle that as as a judge or is that someone else's job to get that you know information to you well yeah uh, different when there are lawyers and when there are not lawyers because lawyers usually know the rules of you know taking turns and not interrupting and you know rules of evidence things that can be said and brought into court and things that can't uh, mm -hmm. when, there, when there isn't, what I what I try to do, because a lot of those cases are what we call pro se, so that's without counsel. And so I just try to explain what the rules of the court are. So each party is going to get their opportunity to be heard. Uh, you know, occasionally you might hear something that you don't think I should hear, and you can mm -hmm. object. And then I say, and I say, like, you can't interrupt each other. And, and I usually laying that out just gives gives a little bit of one understanding or could, you know, understanding. Um, but two, it it gives everyone the opportunity. So even if someone, you know, if I hear the story that, that is that is completely different than the other, you know, definitely that, that's going to be harder to, to hash out what reality is, or what the truth right. is. However, you know, if we at least let the parties, you know, present that evidence, then I can try to weigh what testimony is more likely to have occurred or did occur. You know, again, as long as you're not interrupting, as long as you're not combative, but then that's a whole other thing. If I see that, you know, the the alleged abuser is really combative and abusive in the courtroom, it's like, well, there goes your, <laughs> there goes your <laughs> uh, yeah. which I've seen, and and I've seen from um, from the other end too. Like I've had, you know, someone that I was surprised, you know, brought the claim as victim, and then came into court, and it was pretty apparent by his demeanor and his, his actions that he was in fact the abuser uh, and she, and he was just using that to control her. And, you know, again, that's, that's why we have those court hearings. And I know it's, and I acknowledge the stress and the difficulty of a victim going there right. or even someone that's accused of a crime. The court's a scary place for everybody, but that's why we have to, you know, I try to, I try to come to it as a nice, as, as, a, as a kind person, a judge, I will enforce the rules of the court, but you know, I'll just be there, lay it out and give everyone the opportunity to have their day. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really good to hear because it, it is very scary to go to court. Um, thankfully, my uh, former abuser and myself, we were able to come up with terms during mediation and we never made it to work, I mean, to work, to, to court. <laughs> um, so we didn't, I didn't have to go through that process, but I do know victims and even friends who are now advocates who share their stories about having to go to court and feeling re-victimized again and just, you know, not feeling the compassion from the, maybe the officers that came to the scene when they reported it or um, from the judge who really didn't seem to, to let them say their piece and so forth and so on. So. 
um, when Tara told us about you, she talked about how compassionate you were and how you really believed in what you were doing and that um, domestic violence was um, was something that you did not tolerate, did not tolerate, and that you were very much an advocate against it, um, which was something that was that strikes me as different because just helping victims in the system, we have run across police officers who are not compassionate, who, um, you know, they, all they see is, did you get hit or did they, was there a bruise? And then they're, you know, they're taking, taking sides or something like that, where there's no compassion there. Um, I know that a lot of advocacy programs, including ours, we talk to police officers about the need for being compassionate, the need for knowing about domestic violence, the need for understanding that there are different forms of domestic violence, not just physical. And it doesn't have to be about a black eye. It could be so much more than that, that you might not see on the surface. Um, so for you, um, when it comes to domestic violence, are you dealing mostly with the physical abuse or are you seeing cases that are reaching you that are, are purely emotional, mental, financial abuse? Are you seeing those kind of cases? Yeah, yeah, the law does allow for that. So with a domestic violence protective order, which is primarily what I'm saying, because I said I only hear the criminal stuff on our rotation. Mm -hmm. um, but with the uh, with that, I mean, it allows for harassment. It allows for obviously stalking. Um, okay. So yeah, the the law does allow for for us to to address those, and certainly um, quite frequently that would be brought up as a claim. Now I, I would say sometimes sometimes it wouldn't amount initially as an emergency. So that's the first step when you go to the magistrate, but they still give you a court date. So just because, you know, say for example, that harassment isn't a pending emergency. So the magistrate and the judge are like, yeah, they're not in danger for life, for harm or, or life or limb. But that doesn't mean it doesn't amount to domestic violence that would warrant a protective order uh, down the road. So again, that's where we get to, it's so important to come to court. You know, coming to court is, you know, where we can address all of those issues and we can um, do our best to help people. Right. I think that's really important that you said that as well, that it, you, you guys are aware that there's more than one form of domestic violence and that you guys are taking that just as seriously. Is it harder for you to, um, I'm really not sure what the the judge name is is the, the wording for it, but is it harder for you to, I guess, pass judgment or make a, I don't know what the wording is, <laughs> for you to, to give your final, whatever it's called, um, when there is no physical abuse? Does that make it hard? Yeah, um, so I guess when I, um, when I do make my ruling or my decision, it's, it's based on- Emotional abuse? Yeah, it's based off all the factors. And I'm kind of losing you here for a minute, so I'll, I, I think I'm, but um, it, it's based off all, all, any of the factors of the relationship. And I mean, you know, sometimes we'll have to issue something, you know, it, you know, I've, I've had weird experiences where it's just around the holidays, where it's really something we just need a DDPO to go from Thanksgiving past New Year's. You know, it's, you, you know, it just depends on the family it depends on the circumstance. And that's why it's important for judges to take their time. And, and in the end, when we do the sentencing or we make the final decision after the evidence is presented, we can still ask questions to find out like what's gonna work here. Right. You know. Now, when you are um, talking to the adults in this situation and there are children involved, do, do the children themselves have to be a part of the proceedings like giving um, maybe testimony or anything, or how do you handle the sensitivity of dealing with children who are victims of domestic violence as well? I, I really don't like kids to be in the courtroom with their parents at, at all. And, and I, I kind of lay the line down there. When there have definitely been circumstances where I'd, I've had to talk to kids, right? And, um, and when we do that, we can kind of clear the courtroom and, just let me have a conversation with the kids. But I certainly don't want a lawyer to cross-examine a child, you know. And a lot of times, the lawyers understand. And they'll they'll tell me the kind of you know this is what I'm really looking at, like this question A, and the other lawyer will tell me oh, I'm looking for this A, B, and C. And so I will end up, you know, again I'm a dad, 
I'm an uncle. I've talked to kids plenty of times, like in a, in a again, a compassionate way uh, without traumatizing a child, because you certainly don't want to traumatize a kid any more than they already are. Uh, we can address most of the questions, you know. But yeah, like just putting a kid up there with their parents, like, eh, or, or the potential abuser, like it's, it's nothing a child should have to go through. Right, right. I agree. I agree. Yes. Yeah, so you've been doing family court or as a judge for almost a year, going on a year. Are you interested in doing anything else outside of family court? I, I love what I'm doing now. Um, when I was at the um, public defender's office, one of the things, um, you know, we, we, we'd run into, it's kind of such a short term time that you're working with somebody, you know, it's like you try to address, you know, systemic racism that just something you can't address, you know, from, from a one time advocacy point to, you know, mental health and substance abuse there are so many things that you're trying to help this one person navigate. And, you know, your representation is over a short period of time. Uh, what I can do as a family court judge, because a lot of times I'm with the family, you know, from the time they're separated or the time, the time they're in court until the child's an adult. So I could really invest a lot of time trying to help someone and guide someone into adulthood, which I really appreciate that point. Like, so I'm, I'm happy here right now. I'm not looking to leave family court anytime soon. Um, but uh yeah, well, well, ask me again in, in like six years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, I like the fact that you are, you're, ve you're vested. You're invested in what you were doing um, because I'm assuming with criminal court, you have a criminal that comes in, they're charged with whatever crime they, it is. The judge is on there for that amount of time. And then after that sentencing and that's it. They're done with it. Um, with you, you're able to follow the family. You're able to see their progress. You're able to, um, you know, offer support. So one of the the support that I want to ask you about is how many of your decisions include counseling. Is mm -hmm. mental health a, a big, um, I guess, added added <laughs> need for your couples? Is that yeah. something that you will put in effect that is needed? A lot. <laughs> I definitely do. But that's 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 another like economic gap concern too, because not all families are going to be able to access counseling. And you know, I certainly ask them, do, do you have insurance? Is there something we can do? And there are some services available. There are some um, places, for example, that will give a free mental health assessment. You know, like like Monarch will do that. But it's it's limited, and it's limited what we can do. Um, so we have to know what nonprofits offer what programs in those, those circumstances and then um, try to be creative. One thing, one thing that would really change everything is if we could have um, child advocates for every family case, which is yeah. a big dream that I, I really wish we could work out because I'm, I'm from Florida originally. Uh, I, I have friends that are, are guardian items for the state mm -hmm. down there and they, mm -hmm. I mean, they appoint to every case. I mean, you know, just, just give, e even if it's just a quick analysis on a, on a very simple, you know, it's not a complex separation or it's not a complex, we just need a, a child custody, you know, agreement between mom and dad that haven't had any issues of DV. They just need something written in paper. Just the opportunity for someone to talk to the child just to make sure there isn't anything, you know, behind the scenes that we aren't seeing. You know, just right. that child, to have that child be able to speak through an advocate, to have someone else there. That would be a game changer. That's really what I'd, I'd love to be able to work on and develop for Mecklenburg County. But it's going to take some time to, to kind of get that together. Right, right. Um, and I do know that that program is out there, but I also understand that um, probably not every child is getting that service. Um, so is that something that you are maybe thinking about putting some effort into? <laughs> yes. And there's, um, yeah, so our, our new chief justice um, or chief judge, um, Elizabeth Trosh, is, is doing a phenomenal job because she, she took over right when COVID happened which has been mm -hmm. her, but, mm -hmm. but we, we've spoken about, about expanding um, advocates and, and she's a, a long time juvenile court judge. So okay. uh, yeah. We, we're, so she recognizes the need for it as well. Certainly, yeah. But again, these are one, you have to, again, as a judge, we don't, we don't make policy or law. We can just kind of, we can help, help mold the system that we work in a little bit. Um, right. But you know, a lot of that's gonna be trying to find grants uh, trying to get the county or the state behind it, 
and then we'd be leaning on a nonprofit agency, which is a great nonprofit, Council for Children. But again, there's there's a lot of moving parts on that. But I think right. that would really change um, the way we serve children and families in our community. Right, right. Um, I know that one of the one of the issue well one of the issues that I brought to you when we were having um, our our conversation between the two of two of us was what happens if you have a family and the family is not satisfied with your decision? What does that process look like? Yeah, um, it happens sometimes, you know, and usually, you know, what, what, I, what I often say in, in family court when it's dealing with a custody case, I'm not making a decision based off mom and dad. I'm making a decision off what's the best interest of the child. And that's a standard that we have to. And if, and if someone leaves the courtroom in a child custody case that they couldn't come to terms on and they couldn't come to a consent on, uh, and someone leaves the courtroom really happy and the other one's really sad, then th that's, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> but, you know, it's it, it, no, usually no one's going to get exactly what they want, right? It, it's, it's just it. If you, now the best thing possible, you know, is if, if a parent, if, if a family is in a situation where they're separated and they can come to those terms on their own, I'm probably not going to do that much better in a hearing. I'll try. I try to get to know the family best I can and take the time, like I said, but, um, you know, that's it. Like we're making those decisions based off the kids. Right. You know? right. Yeah. Right. That's good. That's good. Um, that, because a lot of, I think a lot of parents get so caught up in their hatred for one another or what went wrong in the marriage or the relationship that they don't think about the kids. And mm -hmm. it's more about wanting to get back at the other parent or hurt the other parent. And so now you have this child in the middle who is really suffering because the parents just can't get along. <laughs> Yeah, it's completely accurate. And I mean, I, it's really sad because, you know, you have someone that both parties love and both want to have the best life possible, both parents, but, you know, they get, they get wrapped up in their own relationship and all of those problems and they hurt the, their kid, the one that they both love, like the one goal that you think that they'd be able to agree on. Let's do the best we can for them. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's disheartening. I'll, I'll have a hearing and I'll keep reminding folks. It's like, I don't need to hear about, you know, this affair and this affair and, and this <laughs> transgression. I was like, I, I get it. Those are bad things, but I, how are we going to work to make sure this child lives a productive, healthy, happy life with both of you in it? That's right. what we need to look at. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes. Um, okay. So I want to get a little personal, if you don't mind. Um, I know that you are married. How long have you been married? A little over 10 years. We had our 10-year anniversary during COVID. <laughs> and wow. <laughs> so you had your 10-year anniversary during COVID. And that's a pretty big anniversary. So what did you guys do to celebrate? <laughs> <laughs> we were stuck here. You know, we didn't, um, yeah, we, we had planned. We were going to go down to Savannah, you know, mm -hmm. have a little Little, little couple's time down there, um, but uh, we stayed. We stayed here in Charlotte. Um, we uh, we had our boys with us. We ordered out from a good restaurant, and we are postponing. And whenever we're we're through COVID, we'll go on a trip, a delayed, a delayed, delayed anniversary trip. But um, you know, it's 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 been hard. But you know, there are some still silver linings to to this difficult time, and, and I've I've been able to. As I mentioned before, I, I have court from my house in the afternoons, and I've been able to see my, my youngest um, go through some stages, kind of see him learn to crawl, and I see him like as a little daredevil trying to climb everything, which is a lot of things I would have been away from before. So right. so even though we miss stuff like going to Savannah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you got to take some of the positive out of it. So. Yes, yes, definitely. And I know you have, you have two sons, correct? That's right. Okay. <laughs> so how do your, how do your kids, or are they old enough to understand what you do? No. I've, I've tried. No. My, my four-year-old's my older okay. one, and, and he just, okay. I, I try to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wear a preacher's robe. That's, he understands that. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not a preacher. <laughs> so I 
I just say I try to help people. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, um, I know right now that um, I'm studying to my, my master's become a clinical mental mental health therapist. And so I always ask, like we had a counselor before, um, Mr. Damian Harmon, and I asked him the question, because you're a counselor, do people expect you to always have all the answers and to always be, be the one that everyone goes to? So you're the judge. Does, does your family always come to you about their family problems or do your friends always say, hey, let's go to Rex so he can handle this for us? <laughs> do, you, do you deal with that with your family and your friends? <laughs> Well, what I get is legal questions that I, I just have no idea on. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like, if you ask me questions about it, like a mortgage or something, insurance related, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't, <laughs> you know, just because it's the law doesn't mean I, I know it. Like, it's you know not, everything. <laughs> that's, yeah, or, or will stuff. Like, I, I don't know anything about wills. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, that's where I get it. You know, they'll ask me quite random stuff. It's like, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just as clueless as you are. <laughs> right, right. Okay. What are some other things that you're passionate about in the community? We know that you're very passionate about family. What are some other things that you're passionate about? Um, well, right now, I'm, I'm really passionate about improving the system for everyone. And, um, and you know, we've got to be really uh, cognizant about what's going on with COVID, um, but also the movement about Black Lives Matter and just being re-envisioning what court does. Because you have to acknowledge that a lot of people in our community don't see our systems of, of justice as, as just. And a lot of that's based off of historical um, problems that still manifest in systemic racism. So that's something that we've been really working on. And I can say that I have some very excellent colleagues um, that have been here longer than me uh, that have been putting a lot of effort. So what we're trying to do and what I, we've been able to do is, is look at how the court system operates how it has operated and how the pandemic has made us reshift and reevaluate things to eliminate some of those processes that um, are one, wasting time or two, that create barriers to access to justice. So that's, that's something that, um, that I've, I've been pretty passionate about now. And, you know, I'm, again, I'm our youngest judge, so I'm a little more technically technical savvy than some of the others. So I've, I've been really, I think that technology, although we do have a technology gap, not everyone has access to, um, you know, a, a working phone and great internet. And we need we need to work on that as a community. Uh, hopefully, you know, and we we almost had that Google Fiber stuff in the city. <laughs> you know, you know, we, you know, once once we can get there, if we can really strive to get there, um, there's no reason that everyone has to come to court. Like we can bring court to people, which, you know addresses issues of transportation because a lot of you know when I was a, when I was an attorney I had a lot of clients that, that couldn't get to court mm -hmm. you know we can bring court to you um, that helps uh, if, if they if we can eliminate that fear of facing your abuser by bringing court to you mm -hmm. that, you know there's a lot that technology can do and I, I, I know that we can't do everything over the internet but there's a lot we can do um, to help people and bring court and make it more accessible. So. Yes, I, I like that point that you made about being able to remove that, bar that barrier or that fear for victims that really fear facing their abuser. Because it's, it's, again, like I said, it's, it's a big step and it's a big show of strength for a victim to leave their abuser, but even to go to the point of pressing charges against their abuser, that's a big deal for a lot of victims, for, for every victim. Um, a lot of times we find that victims, they just want to get out of the house and get somewhere safe. Mm -hmm. And they don't wanna deal with the court part of it. Um, we find that a lot with, um, with women or men who don't have children. But then you have those victims who have children where it's kind of, you can't, you can't avoid court because now you have children involved. And so being able to have the technology for victims to be able to um, do WebEx or whatever and to go into court would definitely, definitely, I think, make um, a big difference in the attendance of victims because that's, that's a very, very hard thing um, to have to face your abuser in court. 
um, and especially the children, if they've been traumatized or if they've been abused as well. I can definitely see how having technology bring the courtroom to, to victims or anybody who needs to go to, to go to court, how that would be a big game changer to get victims into court. And that might even um, be an incentive for, uh, for victims to speak up about their abuse and to do something about it. Because we know that as a victim, if you don't say anything, then your abuser moves on to another relationship and now they're abusing the next person that they're with. And so we really encourage victims to speak up, to say something, at least do a police report so that you have um, a paper trail or you have something in the system showing what has happened to you, especially if it's truthful information and it's not just trying to get back at someone, which we do see as well. And I'm sure you do as well. So um, I really think that would be a great thing. Is that something that you feel might be a priority um, to be able to have more technology to be able to bring courts to people? And, and, and I to say we're already working and, um, I'm on the domestic violence committee uh, mm -hmm. with uh, three other of our judges and then um, some stakeholders, uh, you know, the DA and uh, the corporate courts and everyone. Um, and uh, what, what, we're, what we have done is set up that technology ability. Um, we're working on um, having a room at the courthouse if someone doesn't have access to technology. Uh, we partnered with Legal Aid. Um, have another, uh, you know, again, so, so that's, that's happening right now. And right. Uh, yeah, again, it's, it's just the ability to look at, look at how the system's been. Where have we, I, can't, I don't want to say failed people, but where, where we have not, gone as far as we can or as good as we can or operating as the best as best we can and and where can we make court work better for everyone in the community in an equitable way and that's, that's you know in my little sphere of family and domestic court that's that's one thing we've, we've, we've done and uh yeah yes yeah. well that is a great thing that is a great thing and i'm glad that you are a part of that and you recognize that that is a need um especially with domestic violence cases because it definitely is um, I think that that would be, uh, it would be a great thing to have that in place for victims to be able to, to, to Skype in or to not have to face their abuser in court um, because it's, it's very intimidating and very scary. And this would allow them the opportunity to have a voice without the, the fear and without the intimidation of their abuser sitting right next to, next to them. So I think that's a, that's a great thing that you guys are working on right now, definitely. Definitely. Um, I want to go back a little bit to, to what you said about um, addressing uh, racism or the issue of Black Lives Matter. Um, what have you done personally, not necessarily as a judge, but you personally, um, to help raise awareness around racism and around the barriers that exist right now? Yeah, well, I'm saying something, which is the least I can do at this point. Um, so um, a, a number of the judges had recently um, done a pledge and it's gonna come out pretty soon uh, to do better, be better. And just acknowledging the statistics are the statistics. I mean, if you're, if, especially if you're an African-American male, you're more likely to get pulled over, you're more likely to have a higher bond. You're gonna, it's gonna be harder to pay the bond, uh, which increases the likelihood that you're going to, to plead or be found guilty of a crime, whether or not it occurred or not. And then having that mark on your record is gonna be there indefinitely. Uh, which only increases the likelihood of that whole process happening again. And, and I mean, you can't, you can't deny what's the part. Um, so we, we have to, one, acknowledge it as a truth, and, and two, try to work to, to make it better. So um, I've, I've worked with my judges on that pledge. And we're working through COVID to reimagine what court is. I was just on a special on WSSC last night um, talking about how our courts work and how systemic racism exists in the court system or the systems of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's that's the first step. It's it's not to hide it. It's just to say it's there. You know, right. it's not, you know. And then we need to work better as a community and as a country to overcome it. Right. Right. Do you find that um, being a younger judge or the youngest judge that you have a perspective? that other judges might not have because you are younger and because you are living in, 
the younger generation where you have a different viewpoint. Um, do you find that that has been an advantage for you or has it been more of a disadvantage? I think it's an advantage. It helps me connect to, you know, a, a, a lot of people in the, in the community that some of the other judges might struggle to. And like I said, we, we, we have we have some very good judges in Mecklenburg County and some have been my, my mentors before I even got here. Um, but I, I think one, it, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of technology. In fact, I'm embracing technology. Um, and then there are certain things that, that I'm not fearful of or leery of that other judges might or reluctant to, to address, you know? So, you know, I'm, I think uh, I think our generation is a little more open-minded mm -hmm. uh, and a little more committed to improving the systems that, have, that we are inheriting. And so I, I fully embrace what I can do as a judge. Right. right. Um, I know your children are young, but when, if your children were older, what would you what would you feel you needed to impress upon them when it comes to the state of the world right now in dealing with racism? Yeah, well, the, the biggest thing, and we, we're already working on this, and there's some literature out there on how to just talk to your kids about the situation, about racism. And again, it's, um, you, you know, I think exposure is one thing. Um, you know, not living in like an insular, like white only world. It's important that kids of all ages like interact with other children uh, from, you know, that's that's one thing. So exposure, and I think that helps you as a, as a human kind of grow up. Uh, for me, sports was a big, a big thing as a kid. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't just hang out with, with again, that, that helps you interact with people with different backgrounds that helped me. Um, so I think, you know, it, it doesn't, not, not that my kids have to play sports. I'm saying, you know, just having that opportunity to interact with people from different backgrounds helps you have a more open mind. Um, and that's something that we're already trying to work on with our, with our young ones. Well, I'll say my four-year-old, not my baby. <laughs> like he <can't>, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't really understand, it. <laughs> but, right. uh, but we're trying to do that. And, and one thing, um, through my own through my faith and, and I'm, I'm a Christian, but from how I was, I was raised uh, uh, community service and service to others is, is a cornerstone of, of, of my family. And mm -hmm. my, my kids are gonna have that experience growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good, that's good. Um, myself, I'm multiracial. So I was built, uh, built, <laughs> I was brought up <laughs> in a community that was very uh, diverse. And so I grew up surrounded by different races. And that's one thing that I have tried to do for um, for my children is we, we don't look at people because of color, we look at people for who they are. Um, and so we, we're constantly getting going out in the community with them. They're constantly volunteering with us, doing different things in the community. Um, we, you know, we, we talk about different cultures, we go to different cultural events, so forth and so on. And one thing that I'm a firm believer is that people are not born to be racist or born to be prejudiced. They are taught that. And so as parents, we definitely have to give them the opportunity to, to learn different cultures and to raise them to, to love and care about everybody. So I, I applaud you for doing that. Um, and you know, it, it, it starts very young and you're already starting. So I, I applaud you for doing that. We, in, in the Black Lives Matter fight, and I'm not sure if you saw the interview with Lily Nicole um, of the lowercase letters a couple of weeks ago, um, she's biracial and she has become the face of the Black Lives Matter movement in Wilmington, North Carolina. And she was saying that at first she felt uncomfortable being the face because she identified more with her Caucasian side, but now she has learned to um, embrace both sides of her, or she's always embraced it, but she was more in touch with her Caucasian side. And now she is able to, to embrace all parts of her. So I think that's really important, you know, with our children for them to not only be able to identify with, you know, with, with your race being Caucasian, um, but also all races around us. And I would assume that that also uh, um, helps you as a judge to be able to identify and be compassion compassionate towards other people um, that come into your courtroom because you don't have that that um, that bias against color. Have you found that 
your 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 openness and your feelings towards race and you know um uh being open to different cultures have you found that that's also been helpful to you as a judge or is that something that you kind of take out of the equation or how, how does that work for you well I, I don't know how not to or i guess speaking out i think it's important that you know as a judge in this community that you're present in all parts of this community mm -hmm. if you have a diverse community um you know uh, in mecklenburg county or a little over a third of the population is african-american uh, we have a, a sizable and growing Hispanic uh, population, mm -hmm. and um, you know there, there there is a growing Asian population as well. And, and we need to take the opportunity to again interact with with people that are different than us. I sit on the board or the advisory board for the International Minority Coalition. Um, through my through my sister's family, we have a, a South Asian connection, mm -hmm. and you know I I, I, do, I I do try to take an opportunity. To, to go around the county, you know, not stay in, in a small, small area, but to, um, again, get to interact with everybody. And I think that does help break down barriers. Uh, right. it, um, again, helps, helps children, but it helps adults. But, yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, we had a question and I was so into asking my own questions. I missed it. Um, so the question was, I know that there was a point where you were saying that um, in response to my mental health question, and is that part of the services that you um, request when you're in court, you spoke of that you ask the victim or the abuser or whoever it is that you feel that needs the, the counseling if they have health insurance. Um, I know that Ms. Tara, she is very a big advocate for Medicare for all. Do you think that universal health care would solve that problem? Or do you feel that there would still be an issue with getting victims and abusers or families to mental health? Or, or is it a, a fact that they just don't have health insurance? Yeah, well, uh, treatment isn't something that we can accept um, insurance for. And there is a cost. And so there's a barrier um, for the abuser treatment um, to a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, with the mental health services, certainly if it's when, when you have insurance, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to address some of the underlying issues. If, and, and as judges, I can't take a, pol a position behind a policy like Medicare for all, but, but I could say, and I actually like the way you phrased it, because I, I can say that, yeah, if, when, when people have health care, it, it's a lot easier for us to get them the services or require the services or request the services. Mm -hmm. it's just, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and that's, yeah, I, I, can, I can wrap up there. Okay. Do you find that um, victims or whoever you feel needs, needs mental health counseling, are you finding that they're resistant to getting counseling or do you find that they might or that they feel because it's coming from you or maybe it's coming from their lawyers that it's actually, it's actually needed. Because I think that part of being a victim, and I can only speak from a victim's perspective, um, I've never worked with abusers, um, but coming from being an advocate, I always, always impress upon victims when I'm, I'm out in the community and I'm talking to people or doing, whether I'm doing speaking engagements, is that there's, there's a, a mentality of going from being a victim to being a survivor. And that starts with how you see the situation that you're in and whether you are able and willing to move forward. And that starts with your, your mental health. Um, so we always try to ask victims to go to counseling because if you stay in victim mode, if you never address the abuse that you've been through, if you've never even addressed the fact that you are a victim, it's very hard for you to take advantage of the resources and the help that is out there and to become a survivor. So for you, when you do ask for the family to get men um, mental health counseling, are you finding that people are resistant to that and that there's a, a bigger need for victims to have counseling when it comes to domestic violence cases? Yeah, I mean, yeah, really a lot of the people in our, our country and our community are, are afraid of mental illness. Um, we'll acknowledge it. And that's not all of it. I mean, counseling, you know, mental illness is, is an issue that is prevalent. Just like you have an illness of your body, it can happen to your mind. That's something we need to acknowledge and contextualize as a medical thing and address as a medical thing and not be afraid of it. I mean, it's, it happens and it's reality. Um, but for the counseling, 
I mean, everyone can benefit from counseling. <laughs> you know, that's the truth. And it's, it's just about living a better, healthier life. And, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I used to, you know, I was an advocate um, uh, at the public defender's office and I, I had represented abusers before. And I just, from getting to talk to people and know people, um, it, you know, it, it's, almost, it's almost universal that everyone had been a victim at one point in their life. Right. You gotta think is even as big and bad as someone grows up to be, mm -hmm. you know, they were a little kid, a little, little innocent baby and something probably happened along the way to them or the structure, the system that they grew up in uh, to, to put them there. And so, right. yeah, you, you probably could benefit from counseling in that situation to try to address what happened to you as a child or a teen or a young adult, um, hopefully not cause any harm to anyone else or to yourself. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I'm a big advocate for counseling and, and I think the court system needs to, and, and I think most judges do also embrace it. It's something we can use to, to help make our community a safer place for everyone. Very good, very good, thank you. So I did have one more question related to domestic violence and then I just wanna talk a little bit more about the fact that um, you, you wanna continue doing this because this, this is what you do, this is what you like to do. Um, so. I know that there are a lot of states who are passing, I guess it would be a bill, that if there is an abuser who owns a handgun, that once they are become go into the uh, DV court or are in a DV case, that all firearms have to be removed from the home. Um, I'm not really familiar if that is actually here in North Carolina. And so my first question is, Yes, is that something that is in effect? And if not, is that something that you um, regularly are faced with um, firearms in the home and having to have those firearms removed from the home? I have to be careful as, as a judge. I can say that the way the law is in North Carolina, um, it, it based off either certain factors occurring, um, I can ban firearms. Or, um, you know, if, if there is an issue of domestic violence, we can based off the circumstances. So, okay. so it does occur, uh, that does bring um, the, the firearms that have to be surrendered to the sheriff. And under some circumstances, um, that party can get their weapons back. Uh, mm -hmm. Some circumstances, potentially they could not. Right, right, okay. Yes, because we know that it, the likelihood of DV turning into a homeless homicide is 10 times if there is a firearm in the home. So that's one of the, the many, one of many issues that as advocates, we um, try to find out when we're working with victims is, do you know if there's a firearm in the home? That's one, probably one of the first five questions that we ask when responding to a, to a victim. So it's interesting to hear, you know, from different advocates in different states how that how that's handled. So um, I'm glad that that is something that you you guys are aware of, and you will take action um, against if you feel the need to do so. So I appreciate you answering that question. Um, okay, so I know that I was looking at your website, and it was saying I want to make sure I get the wording right. Let me make sure. Uh, change. And this is me Googling you, because I, I did that. <laughs> um, and when I did, I saw your website and it said, let's see, it said, keep Judge Marvell. So um, tell us about that. What is, what is going on with you right now? And what do we need to know about you staying in this position? Because you are the judge that we need, especially domestic violence advocates we need judges like you who, who are passionate about mental health, who um, are passionate about um, making sure that everybody's treated equally, who is passionate about family and understands the importance and has the background to understand how a judge's decision affects the whole family. We also need a judge who is understanding and compassionate um, when it comes to domestic violence and understands that it can be a very stressful and traumatic um, experience for victims, um, for families, even abusers, I'm sure it's very stressful and traumatic for them as well. So we need you to, mean to be and continue to be 
a judge in family court. So what can we do as a community? What can I do as a Speak Up and Inspire series and as an advocate um, in the community to help you stay where you are? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, just I, I will be on the ballot in November. Um, I am I am the Democrat. There is a, uh, I have a, a Republican challenger. I, I wish the races weren't partisan. I, I mean, they, they shouldn't be, but you know, they, they are now. It's countywide. So anyone in Mecklenburg County uh, that's, that's watching, I, I am your, your judge in family and domestic court. And I do want to stay there to help improve the lives for everyone in our community. Um, ways you can help me is by uh, following me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, letting other people know about my race. Uh, the most important thing is to vote. Uh, you know, this is a very important year for so many reasons. Mm. Um, we can see what's happening in our country. We have to vote. Uh, and uh, the important thing is, in, yes, everyone's, I think, you know, we're going to have an astronomical turnout for the top of the ballot. Um, but those other races really matter. You know, your county commissioners impact uh, your life and your judges do. And it's not, again, like I said, it's not just the family that I see in front of me. It's a ripple effect. It's mm -hmm. the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents and the cousins. I mean, it's, it really impacts the whole community. So that's why, you know, it's important to get to know the other, the folks at the bottom of the ballot, like the judges. Um, so please, you know, please, please, please vote. Don't forget your judges. Um, follow me on Instagram, uh, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, check out my website. Uh, you know, this isn't a normal campaign season. So I, I you know, I am very thankful uh, for, for you having me on to talk because this is how we campaign now. We have uh, have conversations with people online and, um, and through podcasts. And I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for you, Tiffany, for getting the opportunity to, to, to let me talk with you and speak with you. And, and that's the best I can do, you know, just uh, share my page if you can. Um, we have campaign yard signs if you if you want one we can arrange a pickup or drop off I love that. okay yeah. <laughs> that's that's what you can do but most importantly please vote this is such an important year uh for for me certainly but for our country and our community and we really need everyone to to take the time to to vote nice nice um we uh spoke to um charles robinson um, a couple of weeks ago, and we also talked to Brandon Chuck Brown and Judith Brown, who are doing a lot in the community um, right now to get people to the polls. Um, so I definitely am going to ask them to watch this podcast um, so that they can learn more about you because they are um, they're in the community, they're doing great things in the community, and they want people to get to the polls. And that is their priority um, along, you know, in addition to what they already do in the community, that has become a top priority for them. Um, we interviewed them a couple of weeks ago. So I would encourage you to check them out as well to see who they are. And I'm gonna do vice versa because I think that when you have people who are passionate in a community and especially want to get people to the polls that I, would, I wanna connect them with people that I think um, that are like you, who we need to have there, that we need to have for the people, for our families, because our families are the foundation for everything, for our community. And without families, then, you know, there's there's really not much, there's really not much else. We, we need families to be strong and we need families to be cared for and supported. And that's, that's where it starts, especially for our children. So, um, I completely back you up. I think that you are wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm just really excited to, to talk to you and to, to learn about what you're passionate about and about who you are as a person and also as a judge. Um, as an advocate, I am gonna ask you to um, please take the time to get to know victims um, when that are going to your court. Um, I'm also going to ask you to please help in reducing uh, re-victimization that can take place during the process. Um, I'm also going to ask you to, if possible, to see if there's um, uh, a support, or an advocate or someone that can accompany uh, victims 
as much as possible because it's a very emotional, traumatic process for, for victims to have to go through this. Um, and when they come in front of you, it's, it's just as scary and it's just as traumatic, whether it turns out favorably or not. Um, I'm also gonna ask that you continue protecting our children um, because they are innocent victims and sometimes whether they have actually been abused themselves or they've witnessed it, they are still victims. And so I'm gonna ask you to and encourage you to continue fighting for the children, fighting for their rights and not looking at the parents and the squabbles and so forth, but really looking at what is best for the children. Because in a lot of instances, we have seen that the abusers are getting awarded custody of children because of all of the lies and all of the drama that happens in the court process. Um, and then the children end up with the abuser and then we're fighting another fight. Um, so I wanna ask you to please look out for our children um, and please continue to protect them like you said that you do. Um, and just reach out to us advocates. There's a lot of advocates in the community um, who are fighting against domestic violence, as, such as myself and so many other advocates who are here to support you in supporting, um, in supporting victims. So I would really encourage you to look into those organizations, look into advocates in the community and um, maybe having support partnerships or just some kind of way where you can be um, more involved with the advocates in the community because we are out here and we definitely need a judge who is really, really for um, reducing domestic violence and even more than anything else is just to please um, understand that domestic violence comes in all forms and it's not just physical and to please take it as seriously as you do physical or sexual abuse but the emotional and mental abuse that takes place in domestic violence cases um, sometimes is, is more hurtful than a, than a fist. And it's as equally as important to be heard. So that's what I would ask you as an advocate. And I want to say, I'm, I'm very proud of you. I have not met you in person, but when I do, I hope you'll, you'll take my hug because I'm gonna try to give you one. <laughs> and thank you so much to your family for, um, for supporting you and in, in your goals and your career. And I am looking forward to November and seeing your victory um, because I definitely believe that you deserve it. So thank you for your time. Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Oh, how can we find you? How can we find you on Instagram and Facebook? Uh, yes, handles I believe on uh, Facebook. It's Keep Judge Rex Marvel. Uh, okay. On uh, Instagram, it's at uh, Keep Judge Marvel. Twitter, I'm pretty sure it's at Judge Marvel. And then okay. my website is KeepJudgeMarvel.com. Keep okay. Got and it. if I could add that to the bottom of of the podcast, I guess I can add that in comments um, so people can find me. Okay, yes, and that's that was going to be the next thing I was going to say. If you can, um, after the podcast, if you can just go into the comments and put the links where everybody mm -hmm. can find you so that we can um, keep in touch with you. And I'm going to reach out to you soon because I would love to follow up with you um, before November to get you back on so we can talk more about the, um, the elections coming up. So thank you again for your time. We appreciate you. And please continue to um, doing good work. We I really, truly appreciate you and your time. Thank you so much, Kathy. It was really, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. Can't thank wait. you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, and please tell your wife and your and your children thank you for your time as well. Thank you. Good night. Good night.